We live today in the time which is the worst one of all because now we have all uh, heresies during the all centuries combined into one big heresy. Let us take the great Saint Maximus, the confessor, and Saint Marcus of Ephesus, they say. If your priest, your bishop, your patriarch is in a heresy, you have to cut yourself from him. Because if you don't cut yourself from him, you are united with him in the heresy. So he calls, with other words, our saints like thieves who are in the justice hand of Christ, while he is now bringing again peace by uniting all the heretics into a falsehood. Those who forced it or brought it into life, like Miletus Metaxakis, here again on the website, we see in the Grand Loja how Miletus was a member of them and they proclaim it until the day of today to be a Freemason, you see? And you know if people say, Despota, your eminence, please, where are the miracles today in the church? One of the miracles was in 15 September 2016 that the saint kept quiet. Because if the saint would not keep quiet, believe me, the whole Vatican had be to be shaken. And he calls himself the defender of orthodoxy и хранить чистоту православной веры, сопротивляясь всякой ереси и всякому соблазну. They signed this historic joint statement two hours after their closed-door meeting. As demonstrated with this embrace, both churches are much closer today than they were yesterday. You know what he is? He is a defender of heresy and nothing orthodox is on him. Like uh, Archbishop L.P. Doforos of America is saying, I want that we go in Seville. Now let us put the picture of him with the cravata, you see? It's this. <laughs> Is this a hierarch? While the faith, the foundation starts with the baptism, they started to break down the faith with the baptism. So therefore, these hierarchs of the modern time in world orthodoxy are, I'm sorry to say, but Judas. This is, for example, Metropolitan Augustinus, the Metropolitan of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. He has his prayers with Catholics, Protestants, female Protestant bishops, and so on. They said and confirmed that ecumenism is holy and it is in the tradition of the Holy Church Fathers. <laughs> I truly ask, which Saint Fathers did they ever read? I worked very hard on this documentary in order to provide to you the truth, the pure honey, the sweetness of our faith. I really believe if this documentary is not sufficient for you to understand what is the truth, I truly believe is an, if an angel from heaven comes down to you and explains to you the truth, you will never come to the truth.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Greetings, love, and blessings from Germany to every one of you. I am Metropolitan Moses of the Metropolitanate of Germany. Today we are going to accomplish together the third, and with this, the last part of our so important documentary of the history of the Church. My beloved, before we start now, let us have again a short look about the first part and the second part. We, we have seen in the first part how our Lord Jesus Christ established the Church, how He uh, have sent and empowered the Holy Twelve Apostles and the Seventy Disciples with the um, Holy Spirit and they became High Priests, then how they consecrated bishops for all over the world. We saw and we have seen the, fir, uh, the seven holy ecumenical church councils and we discovered how vigilant our holy church fathers were always uh, trying to protect the true faith of the church and uh, how they condemned the heresies. We, we have seen how several heretics were cast out of the church and with them their established uh, apostate denominations. In the second part of our documentary, we have seen the um, falling apart from the true Orthodox Church, the West, how it uh, became apostate and then we went through theological, dogmatical and historical uh, points and we discovered that they have changed the faith, uh, the faith uh, so much that uh, they are not uh, to be addressed as a church at all anymore. We went through the Protestantism, we discovered the Protestantism, the free churches, and they ended up uh, today to have around 45 up to 50,000 different denominations, while everyone is preaching something else and believing something else. We understood that uh, until the year 1924, the Orthodox faith uh, was unchanged and from there we stopped and from there we are going to start our part now, our third part. We have to understand, my beloved, that the Orthodox Church always was called genuine. What does it mean genuine? Genuine means true. The Orthodox Faith is the right belief, the true uh, confession, the true worship uh, of God, of the one true God. The Orthodox Church never accepted any um, heretical movement or any dogmatical thing within her borders. Why? Because heresy, apostasy, it means to be cut off from Christ, to be got, cut off from God. So, therefore, we are called Orthodox because we have in our teaching no falsehood. Nothing wrong is in the teaching. It is all holy. What happened in 1924? There, we, we must uh, understand that the Orthodox Church in general started to walk on a path to change the true Orthodox faith. Therefore, we say that from 1924, a huge part of the Orthodox Church became also heretic and it became schismatic. What happened in 1924? In order to understand what happened in 1924, we must go to the year 1920 in order to discover the preparement of that what took place in 1924. In 1920, we had a patriarch, his name was Germanos V, uh, the fifth of Constantinople. He started to change the tradition 
of the Holy Church Fathers by an official letter he wrote as a patriarch uh, under the name of we are writing to all churches in the world which we know and we don't know why is this so dangerous I tell you why because until that day all our Holy Church Fathers and all our saints, even until the day of today, never proclaim a heretical movement or a schismatical movement or any um, heresy as a church. We learned about this in the first part that there are always people inside the church and those who are outside of the church. The church can never be divided as we understood because God is never divided. As we have one God, we have one church, we have one truth which is never divided. So therefore, you can never address any denomination outside of the Orthodox Church as a church. You are simply call them apostates or heretics. This is it. And he tried now to put the true faith, the real Orthodox Church, as a member or as a, um, as a part of a cha uh, chain which is uh, one denomination of so many denominations which we have to accept as a church. This was the beginning now for a lot of heretical movements within th these so-called world orthodox. Please, for you to understand, because in this uh, video I am going to use this word very often, world orthodox. Who is the world orthodox? The world orthodox are those hierarchs, those patriarchates, and those priests who serve in let's say, under the name of orthodoxy, but who became, in fact, heretics because they accepted several heretical teachings within their institution and they cut themselves uh, off from the true faith of real orthodoxy. So what happened then in 1923, pa the Patriarch of Constantinople, Meletius Metaxakis IV, he ordered that the calendar of the Holy Church has to be changed into the Gregorian calendar, which was established by Pope Gregory XIII in the year 1582. And this was very, very harsh and very terrible, and it was very, very evil. First of all, we have to understand that this uh, patriarch of Constantinople, Miletus Metaxakis IV, he was a Freemason. So now, maybe someone is going to say, it's easy to say he was a Freemason. Uh, do you have any proofs? Please look at uh, the website here of the um, Freemasons of the Great Loge uh, of Greece. And we see here, until the day of today, his picture with his biography that he was a member. You see? What is Freemasonry? Freemasonry, or the Freemasons, are trying to establish one new religion which contains all religions that uh, from all religions there will be a confessing one religion, confessing one God who is a God for all of them and therefore the ecumenism and the interreligious dialogue is a Freemasonry um, movement and we have to understand that our Holy Church from the very beginning they uh, put the Freemasons under the anathema. It means whoever is a Freemason then he is cut off of the Church. The Freemasons try to prepare the way in fact for the Antichrist, because the Antichrist, when he is coming, then he will have the power on earth, 
ruling everywhere under the aspect that he is not he is now the real savior and the messiah of the world you see that this is a very evil and uh, devil uh, and devastating uh, approachment of destroying the uh, souls of the people and unfortunately this Meletus Metaxakis he was a Freemason and he tried in the office of the Patriarch of Constantinople to destroy the Orthodox Church so he in 1923 ordered the change of the calendar and what happened finally then in 1924 and this is now the very important date in 1924 the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople Gregor the seventh he brought then this uh, new calendar into life and what happened to them I tell you right after uh, they passed away through a very very tough heart attack not to speak even about the funeral of uh, metaxakis that the earth they buried him in, uh, inside the earth of course and then three times it was uh, floated with water and um, he was sh uh, taken off by the water from the earth not even the earth wanted to carry him to accept him you see how God performed this divine sign that he did not bless the change of the calendar the calendar change in fact brought a schism into the church in the beginning in order for you to understand we will come to this what is the patristic calendar and what is this new calendar to, to have a better understanding in the deepness of the matter I want you to understand that the most of the Slavonic uh, ecumenical churches of today they have still the old calendar so it means that according to the world calendar we are celebrating or they are celebrating 7th of January Christmas the same we the genuine Orthodox Church we celebrate 7th of January the Christmas the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ um, 7th of January according to the patristic calendar is still the 25th of December Hopefully we will come back to this in order for you to understand what is the difference and how is this uh, all uh, come together. After 1924, the ecumenical patriarch changed the calendar. What happened? The Church of Greece, it means Athens and all Greece, in the same year they changed the calendar. In Cyprus, also 1924 the Romanian Orthodox Church also in 1924 the Patriarchate of Alexandria in 1928 the same with Antioch and then the Bulgarian Orthodox Church changed the calendar in 1968 and then finally now this so-called Ukrainian Autocephalus Church under Constantinople now in this year 2023 they changed the patristic calendar in this Western uh, apostate one the thing is now that from that time of 1924 the mentality of this patriarchates towards those heretics changed they did not anymore call them apostates they started to call them churches and here you see the great difference between the teaching of the Holy Church Fathers all the saints we venerate in the church who never addressed this people and this denominations churches they simply call them heretics or apostates now these one call them they are churches very dangerous because of that that the church is always one it exists in the truth of Christ you see so if you try to address any heretical movement as a church it means you are dividing Christ by putting false teaching into the true teaching it is very very 
deep, uh, um, um, a very harsh and deep beat against the truth. So now, from that time, they started the ecumenism and the religious dialogue. The ecumenism first uh, started through this so-called Christian denominations. After, within this so-called Christian denominations, they moved forward and established a religious dialogue. The religious dialogue is not a dialogue as some are understanding, like we are sitting in an office and talking about religion. No, they pray together, they venerate together, they establish their faith together, they proclaim that they have uh, the same God, and so on and so forth. And this is something what our holy saints, our saints even over the modern time, such as Saint Nikolai Velimirovich or Saint Justin Popovich or our Saint Geronda Hieronymus of Egina, uh, called the heresy of heresy, the pan heresy. What is a pan heresy? Pan, it means all. It means it includes all heretical movements into one heretical movement. So instead of now saying this is wrong, that is wrong, this is wrong, and this is the truth, and we have to follow the truth in that way, they started to bring all these heretical teachings together and watch part two and part one. Uh, in which I describe to you the main uh, false teachings and now they say, ah, forget about what is wrong about this. The most important is we are together. This is very dangerous, my beloved. Why? Because falsehood is never leading anyone to eternal salvation. This is the problem, you see? So therefore, our holy fathers of the modern time are calling this uh, ecumenism and this interreligious dialogue as the worst and the most evil and the most dangerous heresy of all times. You see? How dangerous. So it means we live in a time where we have uh, to be even more carefully about our uh, spiritual life than it was in the decades and in the centuries before. So you see, this ecumenism, this falsehood of teaching, which entered now the true faith of orthodoxy, poisoned many, many faithful. If you today look at many um, orthodox uh, faithful, then you see that they call themselves orthodox, but in fact, their behavior and the way how they believe is either Protestant or Catholic or it is something else. It is very, very dangerous. Concerning these uh, false teachings, there is a very good uh, book, for example, here we have it in German, and I know it is available also in English and, of course, in Greek and in the Slavonic um, languages. A very good uh, book concerning the seven holy ecumenical church councils, how the teaching of the church was always confirmed. These hierarchs of today of the world orthodoxy, they put the teaching of the holy church fathers on site 
and they say, let us now, we are living now, let us see how we can uh, go and work together and combine whatever we have together. So therefore, these hierarchs of the modern time in world orthodoxy are, I'm sorry to say, but Judas. Why? Because they look like us, like us, the genuine Orthodox. They celebrate in the Orthodox way. They, they west like the Orthodox, but in fact, inside of them, either they are Freemasons or they are Protestants or Roman Catholics or Anglicans or whatever. You see, this makes it more dangerous. As you know, I am f a friend of clear words and straight words. So therefore, I give my speech to you uh, very, very clear so that you don't have any misunderstanding. Now, my beloved, we come step by step. Let us start, as I said, with the calendar. Why we, the genuine Orthodox, or those who are really Orthodox, can never accept the Gregorian calendar? Why we simply cannot? The first reason is because the first Holy Ecumenical Church Council, this, please watch part one, the Holy Church Fathers, among them it was Saint Spiridon of Cyprus, uh, one of them was Saint uh, Nicolaus of Myra, the other was Saint Firmilianus of Caesarea. All these saints who came together, they said, from now on the Julian calendar is the calendar of the church and whoever wants to change it shall be under the anathema. It means shall be cast out, cut off from the church. So now how can you change it? You see, from one side we have to understand that our holy church fathers established this calendar so you are not going to change it. At the same time they um, confirm to us the Pascalion. The Pascalion, it means when it has Pascha to be celebrated. So therefore, they gave us the dates. Pascha, the resurrection of Christ, has to be always something between uh, the Sunday between 22nd of March and 25th of April. So now, if, if, the uh, Gregorian calendar is adapted, what wants uh, Bartholomew, the patriarch, the so-called patriarch of Constantinople, to do from the uh, coming year or from 2025, then it means even this, all they are not going to keep anymore. You see? So they are, they, they are careless about the Holy Church Fathers. I want to give you one of the speeches of Bartholomew who says, the, um, the saints we venerate, you know, when you go to the church, our churches are filled with the ic holy icons of the saints. And what did he say? He said, all these saints are in the justice hand of God because of their mistakes because their fanatism and we are going to correct to 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 bring peace to bring mercy uh, again to the church so he calls with other words our saints like thieves who are in the justice hand of Christ while he is now bringing again peace by uniting all the heretics into a falsehood, you see? So now if you are a Greek Orthodox under the Patriarchate of Constantinople, do you accept this, your Patriarch? How? Then if you accept him as a Patriarch and you follow his sayings and his teachings, then I rather would uh, suggest to you, do not kiss anymore the holy icons of our saints. You know why? Because this would be then a kiss of Judas. Because all the saints are condemning what he is doing. Either you con uh, condemn the saints and follow him, or you follow the saints and condemn him. 
you see? So therefore, it's not easy to switch from one thing to the other and uh, try to think whatever you do, at least you are orthodox. No, to be orthodox, you have always to be careful and vigilant about the faith and follow a true hierarchy. So to be genuine, true orthodox. Then we must understand when Pope Gregor uh, XIII brought this calendar in the West into life right after in the year 1583 and then 1587 and then in 1589 we had three pan-Orthodox councils under the Patriarch Jeremiah's Tranos who condemned this calendar. Again, they excommunicated it, put it under anathema. Pan-Orthodox in that time, it was the Patriarchate of Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, Jerusalem. They said, no one is going to follow it. You see, even, even my beloved, until the year 1920, Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem said, never ever the calendar has to be changed. And then we see in 1924 and in 1928, this patriarchates, okay, Jerusalem did not uh, change it, but they are in communion with this new calendarist. What happened? They immediately changed it. Why? Because of money? Because in that time, and even later, some of their patriarchs are Freemasons and were Freemasons. So it means for prestige, for money, for power, they changed the, the, the tradition of the church. Now the question comes up, my beloved, is the calendar a dogmatical thing? No, it's not. But it has a reverence like a dogmatical thing. I want to explain to you, what is a dogma? Again, watch please part one, part two, there you're going to understand it better. But in a short way, a dogma is a, um, is, is a teaching of the faith. For example, we truly believe that Christ is uh, truly divine and we confess that he is truly human. So this is a dogma, you never can change it. If you change this, that it, then it means you are not a Christian anymore, you see. But the calendar, my beloved, was sanctified over the centuries, the decades, and so on and so forth. And we, it was sanctified by the saints, by the feasts of the saints. So therefore, it is something, uh, a strong foundation, which united the whole Orthodox world always together, that we celebrate always together the feast. This was and is still the foundation that we are known by celebrating everything together. You see, so therefore, my beloved, these patriarchs who changed the calendar, they said we are changing the calendar in order to be able with the Catholics, Anglicans, Protestants, Monophysites and so on to celebrate together uh, the feast of the church. Now the question comes up, why you? Why? You who have, who have the real and the true calendar, the true tradition, why you change it? If the unity is so important for them, let them change it. You know, I, I give you an example. I had a conversation with a Catholic couple before a couple of weeks. They said to me, your eminence, please, please, when is the genuine Orthodox Church changing the calendar so we Catholics and you, the genuine Orthodox Church, can celebrate together Easter, Christmas, and so on? You know what I answered them? I told them, all the time you are changing everything. Nothing is as it was in the beginning of the church. Every year you change almost everything. We are never going to change anything. Since you change everything, it's up to you when you change your false calendar and come back to the truth. You see, this is the real answer to them, not by neglecting our truth and our sanctity and going with falsehood in order to reach out to this false teachings. Then you become one of them, they never become like you. You understand? So, in order now, in Greece, in the year 1924, 
to bring into life the new calendar the Archbishop of Athens of that time, Chrysostomos Papadopoulos, with the power of the military, brought it into life. You see? They used earthly power, worldly power, in order to bring, to change the calendar. And then in that time, in 1924, around 15 up to 20 percent of the Orthodox faithful in Greece, they said, no, 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 no. Never ever, we are never ever going to change the calendar of our holy church. We stay with the old calendar. This was the birthday of the name old calendar or old calendarists. So therefore, if this ecumenist apostates call us the genuine Orthodox Church, oh, they are old calendarists, then you understand, yeah, we are old calendarists because we keep the calendar of the Holy Church Fathers. But it does not mean that we put the calendar like a, an golpio around our neck. No, but we keep the tradition of our Holy Church Fathers. And with this, our old calendar faithful said, we keep the old calendar, we keep the genuine faith, the genuine Orthodox faith. So therefore, if they simply say, oh, the genuine Orthodox Church is a church which is established before 100 years, no, my beloved, is wrong. The genuine Orthodox Church is the continuation from Christ until the day of today. Because we keep the genuinity, the genuine faith of Orthodoxy, and we keep the calendar of the Church, you see? So therefore, we don't care about what they uh, say, and with this in order... Uh, to, to have a look again, those who forced it or brought it into life, like Miletus Metaxakis, here again on the website, we see in the Grand Loja how Miletus was a member of them, and they proclaim it until the day of today to be a Freemason. You see, it's not only a saying like we say something about someone, everything I tell you now, it is founded with proofs, okay? Good. Now, we have to understand from 1924, after the calendar was changed, this ecumenist, orthodox, so-called orthodox priests, bishops, archbishops, patriarchs, started to persecute the real orthodox one. With this, my beloved, I must come to especially make you understand the history in Greece since I belong to the Genuine Orthodox Church of Greece. Of course, the Genuine Orthodox Church in Russia, with the start of the communism, has a different uh, history. They have their uh, history through the catacomb churches, when the communists started to persecute the church, and, to, to, and uh, most of the so-called uh, Moscow Patriarch started to um, have a relation with the communists and they cooperated with them, such as Patriarch Sergius. From him, we have this uh, heresy of Sergianism, the cooperation uh, between church and uh, state, and through that, many of the hierarchs of this uh, Moscow Patriarch, there is blood on their hands. You see? So it means the Russian Orthodox Church, the genuine one, has a, a bit other uh, history in Bulgaria, a other history in Romania, a other history in all these countries. But what brings us together is that we didn't change the faith, faith, we don't change it, we keep the tradition of the Holy Church Fathers and we follow the traditional calendar of our Holy Church Fathers. They started to beat our priests, to put them in prisons. They even killed some of them. It was horrible. So what happened to us? It happened in that time, like through the Crusades or through uh, the uh, 
Ottoman Empire, what happened to us, all this persecution. This time, I call it the worst persecution. Why? Because our own brothers killed us. Our own brothers persecuted us. So then, the, in the encyclica of the Patriarch in 1920 and later then in 1924, the Patriarch of that time said, if we change the calendar, as I explained to you, then we are going to bring all these denominations into one body. And this was the birthday of the ecumenism. Now let us understand what is the ecumenism. The ecumenism, my beloved, started with the Protestants. First of all, the Protestants in the beginning of the 20th century started the ecumenism. First of all, they started ecumenism among them because the Episcopalian with the Anglican, the Pentecost and, and the Methodist and so on, they started to have a, some sort of unity. Then they said, okay, let us have a, some sort of unity with the Orthodox and with the, with the Monophysites and with the Roman Catholics and so on. And they started the World Council of Churches. What is the World Council of Churches? The World Council of churches was established as I said in the 20th century and with this they tried to give a center to all Christian denominations in order to bring them together in order to proclaim there are no different Christian denominations anymore but we all together while we are functioning together in that what we believe, only if we are together, then we become the real church of Christ. And this is the very, very dangerous teaching against that, what our Holy Church Fathers from the beginning taught us. Because the church never stopped to exist. The church always existed and exists in the true confession of faith. Now, these all together say, the church will just then exist totally if we all become again one by proclaiming everyone his own confession of faith. Can you imagine? <laughs> we, will, we will come to this uh, later more, how they tried to bring all this together. Now, the genuine Orthodox Church, or we, the hierarchs, many times people say to us, aren't you a little bit too harsh? <laughs> no, we are not. We simply follow what our Holy Father, Benedict of Nursia, in, uh, who gave his precious soul back to the Lord in the year 547, said, he said, we shall hate the sin, but love the sinner. You see? We love the people who live in heresy because they are people. They are in the image of God. We love them. We want them to come back to the truth. But of course we hate their heresy. We fight this heresy. If we would accept their heresy, then we would not truly love them. Because if you let someone in falsehood, then it means you don't really love this person, you see. So you have to understand what is true love and what is fake love. Anyway, now they say, in this ecumenical movement, that when we are together, as I said, we become the real body of Christ. Meanwhile, they celebrate, for example, this world orthodox, they celebrate the feast of those martyrs who shed their blood while or because they never accepted a heresy. <laughs> you see how paradox it is. Okay. Patriarch Athenagoras, the patriarch of Constantinople, in the year 1965, met with Pope Paul VI, uh, 
And what did they do? They lift the anatema between the west and the east. Now, can you imagine? After the west fall apart as a heretical group from the orthodox, our uh, orthodox church put them under anathema, of course, because they changed the faith. Now they became heretics. <laughs> what did these heretics do? These heretics then excommunicated, have put our true orthodox church in, uh, in the year 1054 under the anathema. Now I ask you something. What power has a heretical group to anathemize someone who is in the true faith? Is it possible? It's not, my beloved. So now in 1965, Patriarch Athenagoras, who was also a Freemason, and Pope Paul VI lifted the anathema. They said from now on, each one of us is no more excommunicated. And then they said, from now on, we accept the mysteries of each other. And this damaged and destroyed and gave like a guillotine, they cut off their own head, this ecumenical orthodox, by proclaiming the Roman Catholics have true and valid mysteries. Everyone who can think only one millimeter, not even a centimeter, just a millimeter, to think about it. If their mysteries are valid, why then? We have the right to exist if what they do in their falsehood, in their easy going, easy life, everything is valid. Why then we keep fasting? Why then we keep this long uh, liturgies? Why then we keep all these rules while they have legitimate and valid mysteries? You see? So therefore, Constantinople today, they proclaim very, very official the Pope of Rome as the Archbishop of Rome, like the Patriarch of Rome, and nothing is dividing us anymore. Can you accept this? <laughs> After you watched part two of our documentary, do you allow yourself to say there is nothing different between us and them? How can you? Not to, to speak even about what Bartholomew said, he said, the church equal to the Orthodox faith or equal to the Orthodox church, there exist more than 360 different Christian denominations equal to Orthodoxy. So it means Methodist, <laughs> Anglicans who have the women ordination, the same-sex marriages, and so on. All these things, he called them equal to Orthodoxy. You accept him an orthodox? How come? How come? So now then, my beloved, they, they moved even uh, further. And then in the monastery of Balamont in, in Lebanon in 1993, they started the Catholics and the Orthodox to say to each other, from now on we are sister churches. <laughs> like... Like the genuine Orthodox Church in Greece and the, let's say, the genuine Orthodox Church in Russia, we are sister churches. Let's put this example. Now they say, with the Catholics, with the Anglicans, with all these, we are sister churches. How come? And then, what did they do? They started in 2006 in uh, Brasilia in February, and in 2007 in Ravenna in Italia, they said that the Orthodox Church and the Monophysites and the Catholics, all of us, from now on, zero. Nothing is anymore separating and dividing us. Watch part one concerning the Monophysites. Remember the great miracle of uh, the saint uh, Euphemia, how she put the confession of faith of the monophysites under her feet and the orthodox confession on her chest. And these heretical bishops and patriarchs say, 
everything is fine, nothing, but nothing is dividing us. So now the thing is, how do they communicate with each other? I want to give you this example. When our Holy Church Fathers, uh, in the time of the Ecumenical Church Councils, please don't confuse, again watch part one, don't conf confuse Ecumenical Church Council with Ecumenism. Huh? I explained it to you. Ecumenical Church Council, it means the bishops from all over the world came together. This ecumenism is a sy syncretic movement by all the divisions to say, oh no, you know, like ironing something and taking away everything what is an obstacle by saying it is good how you believe, how I believe. This is syncretism. This syncretism to bringing them together and to make them equal to each other, this, my beloved, is poison. Therefore, those who follow these people, they cannot be sure anymore about their eternal salvation. You see? So now the question comes up, how do they gather together while our Holy Church Fathers were praying and fasting. They were sometimes not eating, not drinking three days, day and night, until they approached the Ecumenical Council in order through prayer, divine liturgy, holy communion, and fasting to take right decisions in the power of the Holy Spirit. These, it's not a joke. It's true, you can uh, make a research. On the deck of a ship, while they drink, they are drinking, drinking rosetto, champagne, eating caviar, and uh, making barbecue, they make these agreements. Look, look at the confession and the behavior of our holy church fathers, and look at these people huh, who sold the faith for drinking and eating. So now. What did they do with this ecumenism by declaring all these churches are true churches? They made the baptism of all the denominations a legal and valid baptism. You now, can you accept this? If you are a true orthodox one, they have no exorcism in their baptism. Then, like the Protestants, the Catholics, or I explained it to you in the part two, they are baptizing by sprinkling the child, not even uh, uh, with three immersions, not to speak even about the Protestants since 500 years that they have no priesthood, and so on and so forth. They made them all equal, all equal. While Saint Athanasius the Great, Saint Basil the Great, Saint Gregorius Theologos, Saint Firmilianos of Caesarea, these who are the pillars of orthodoxy said, if someone comes from heresy first, he has to be baptized and come. You see, the Orthodox Church has always one door, you have to enter the door in order to become a valid and canonical member. Yes, Saint Basil the Great, he gives us an example in the baptism, if we have a huge number of converters, he says, if it's, it, if it's a huge number of converters, the church can make a um, receivement in mercy by accepting them through holy miron. Not even this they do. They accept the miron of the Roman Catholic one by one, one to one. How is this possible? How can you do this? You see? So therefore, you have so many unvalid priests within this world earth orthodox uh, churches. Why? Because their so-called priests were never even received canonical into the church. So if you understood the case until now, my beloved, then you understand how dangerous ecumenism is. Ecumenism is a new religion not leading to salvation. And then you have to understand that these people 
these patriarchs, hierarchs, and so on, who are in the ecumenism, they cast out the saints within their own borders. But you know, you can never cast out the saints from the church. So it means they cast out themselves from the church. You see? Therefore, I said it in intention, intentionally that they cast out the saints from their own borders because this world orthodox are not to be considered a church anymore. So now, my beloved, let us go even deeper. The ecumenics or the ecumenical churches, this world orthodox, who cooperate with the state and their uh, common prayers and celebrations with the heretics. What do they do? They, they not only make complete prayers together, but even they go and attend divine liturgies, and even sometimes they concelebrate together in different mysteries. For example, an Orthodox priest and a Catholic one, they make the marriage of a, a mixed uh, uh, couple who is Catholic and Orthodox, they, they make the marriage together. How come? How come? How can you do this? Huh? How this ecumenical, um, ecumenist churches go and celebrate divine liturgy on the altar of a Protestant church while the pastor of that Protestant church is a woman, a pastor woman or a pastor bishop and then after celebrating the divine liturgy the pastor woman comes and put again flowers on that table. How come? How? While the Protestant make out of their so-called churches museums and parties and even discos and you go there and celebrate divine liturgy how horrible is this how horrible is this huh? who can answer this so therefore we <clears throat> we have to understand why also this ecumenist orthodox make this ecumenism i tell you why because of earthly power because for money, because of prestige, in order to be like, you know, honorable in the world. Therefore, if you go and look at the ecumenical uh, patriarchate of Constantinople or he, all his bishops, like Archbishop Elpidophoros in the United States, yeah, he, whenever he calls the White House, he can go to the White House and speak with Biden. But they don't say that Biden is even forgetting his own name and he does not even know who he is. They are very proud that they have a, a direct connection to the White House, yeah? Shame on him. And shame on those who say this is orthodoxy. Shame on them. You see? And they call themselves canonical. What canonical is with them? Didn't the church from the beginning was always eager or, or vigilant in order to be dependent on Christ? Of course, we the church try to have the blessing of Christ. We are not going to try to be famous by the state of Germany or United States or Greece or wherever. We prefer to be persecuted and not in honor. As St. Paul, the chief among the apostles says, we the apostles became the last one. You see, we prefer to be persecuted for Christ and not in glory. But they prefer to be in glory and in order to be in glory, they change the faith. St. Paul, the chief among the apostles, said, according to his writings and the letters when we read them, that these people stopped to be true shepherds in the church. Why? Because our holy apostle is teaching us, teaches us, that we have nothing to do with heretics, with falsehood. We, we don't call them even brothers according to St. John the Evangelist, the Theologos, you see. Therefore, we have also to understand, my beloved, what heresy in fact is, as I previously explained to you. 
Heresy, it means I am cut off from God. I give you a short example. There was um, a monk father, a holy monk father. You can read this story in the Gerontikon. This holy monk father, he was very known that he is humble. So there were other monks saying, let us go and, and investigate his humbleness. And they went to him and said, father, you are a thief. He said, he, he said nothing. You are a liar. He didn't respond. You are uh, whatever. He didn't respond. When they said, you are a heretic, he said, I am not a heretic. He could not accept it even for a second. Then they were amazed. Father, why you didn't respond to the other things? Why you responded to this one? What did he explain? He said, I am a sinner and the first among the sinners, I am the most evil person in the world. I need the mercy of God. I accept everything what is said about me. But heretic, I never accept. Because if I am an heretic, it means I am cut off from God. You see? So therefore, my beloved, never allow yourself to be a heretic or to find yourself in a heretical movement because of these these patriarchs these bishops these priests who are in the ecumenism and in the religious dialogue they are cut off from christ you have no salvation there and you should not receive anything from them i give you another example like the Monophysites, you know in the beginning when an Orthodox, even by mistake, if he would go to a Monophysite and, re and receives there uh, the communion, which is not an accepted communion, you know, our Holy Church Fathers, they would punish them even for three years not to receive Holy Communion within the Orthodox Church anymore. If it was by mistake, they made a confession and uh, they gave him absolution and they gave them again communion. But if they went there intentionally, they cut them off even for three years and even longer. Because it is like, considered like adultery against the bride of Christ. So therefore in this ecumenism, many of the uh, so-called uh, orthodox churches, they sent even people to the Catholics to receive communion there. They say, if you don't have an Orthodox priest, go to the Catholic, it's the same. So you see, these are not shepherds. These are thieves because their teaching is not the teaching of our Holy Church Fathers. So now, we see that in this so-called ecumenical movements, this uh, all denominations say, it is good, we, we negotiate the faith, but you know, we never saw that our Holy Church Fathers for, for 1,900 years negotiated the faith. Or within the 5,500 years in the time of the prophets from Adam and Eve until, the, until Christ, when did prophets negotiate the faith? Did you ever see they negotiated the faith? No. They proclaimed the faith and if it was a must, they would even be martyred and they gave their life for, for the truth. And this one, since 100 years, they negotiate the faith while eating caviar. <laughs> <laughs> what did St. Paul say in his writings, and his letters? He is teaching us, after once, twice, you try to convince your brother if he does not believe, so he shall be for you like a sinner. Don't even call him a brother anymore. And you know, so they negotiate the faith and they are very proud by proclaiming nothing anymore is uh, dividing us. Now we come to the problem that I want to explain it to you by this example. I, I know a Catholic pastor, a Roman Catholic one. He said to me, he said, your eminence, you know the ecumenical dialogue is so beautiful because since the ecumenical dialogue, there is no or nothing really anymore dividing the Protestants from us, the Roman Catholics. We became almost uh, the same and we acknowledge each other totally. Isn't it beautiful? And then I said to him, 
I said to him, I want to ask you something. Don't you realize that this ecumenical movement brought the Roman Catholics to become like Protestants in order to be accepted by the Protestants? Isn't it that you changed everything, became like Protestants, that nothing is anymore dividing or separating you from each other? <laughs> you know, he was for a couple seconds silent. And then he said, your evidence, you are right. In fact, we became like Protestants. I said, you see? So it means you become always worse. They never become better. Now, if you look at the, at the world Orthodox churches, so-called churches, you see that this world Orthodox bishops, priests, whoever they are, they became like Roman Catholics. Not the Roman Catholics became like Orthodox. The ecumenical patriarchate, they shave their beards, they go as laymen, like uh, Archbishop L. P. Doforos of America is saying, I want that we go in civil. Now let us put the picture of him with the cravata, you see? It's this, <laughs> it's this a hierarch. And he made the statement with this westing, he made the statement, uh, this is where I want to have our church again, like this. <laughs> While the police or the judge in the court have his vestments in order to be a respectable person, he wants that the priest take off uh, their uh, clothing, their priestly vestments. Now I want to give you another uh, example. It was around in the year... Uh, 1900, so 20 years something before all this uh, started, there was a patriarch uh, and went to the United States and there people said, Your Holiness, is it possible that our priests become like the Catholic, also in civil, shave their beards and become modern? You know what he responded to them? He responded and said, when the priests become thy, like laymen, then the laymen become like devil. <laughs> you see? <laughs> and because of this, since the priests don't respect their own office, therefore the people lost the respect to them and to the church. And what happened? Now look what happened. Here, for example, you see Patriarch Kirill of the Moscow Patriarchate, how he is baptizing, baptizing a child, you see, and he calls himself the defender of orthodoxy. They signed this historic joint statement two hours after their closed-door meeting. As demonstrated with this embrace, both churches are much closer today than they were yesterday. You know what he is? He is a defender of heresy and nothing orthodox is on him. You see, this is, for example, or the baptism of adults, you know, it makes you dizzy. I, I, I discovered so many videos and um, pictures how people are uh, baptized. It is so horrible, my beloved. Today, or until now, we, the genuine Orthodox Church, if someone, of course, comes from the heresy, we always baptize them new. But if from World Orthodoxy uh, people come to us who were baptized, let's say, like Orthodox, we receive them through confession of faith, confession of sin, and through Holy Miron. But now... Slowly, slowly, we cannot continue like this either. Why? Because this ecumenist uh, Orthodox, they do not even baptize anymore properly. You see? This is horrible. While the faith, the foundation starts with the baptism, 
they started to break down the faith with the baptism. So now, if you think about it, that a bishop, a hierarch, is, for example, the protector of faith, these hierarchs are going <clears throat> to lead the people into falsehood and heresy to be cut off from Christ. This ecumenical, this ecumenical so-called prayers, now we can uh, have a look here. This is, for example, Metropolitan Augustinus, the Metropolitan of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. He has his prayers with Catholics, Protestants, female Protestant bishops, and so on. So now, in the end, he gives the bless blessing to the people, one by one, with the Catholic and with the Protestant, while all together make in the same second the cross over the people. <laughs> now, my beloved, if you are an Orthodox woman, please, please ask yourself, for us, the Orthodox, okay? And go with this question to your ecumenist priest or bishop. Ask him, me as a woman, I am allowed, am I allowed to enter the space of the holy altar? They will tell you no. I am allowed to serve the holy altar? No, they tell you no. Then ask them, how is it then possible that our bishop or our priest, one by one, on the holy altar, or from the holy table, they give the blessing one by one with the female bishop, which is totally in heresy, not accepted even baptized, and not even accepted to be a priest or something. How is this possible? You see how paradox Everything is what they do. Do you see it? So now, not only this, even they push the people to have interreligious marriages or interconfessional inter marriages. So here we have different so called priests who proclaim that it is a wonderful thing to, to, be, to have marriages between Catholic and Orthodox or Orthodox and Protestant. I, I, I had here a couple times people from Russia, they said, oh, I am Russian, but my husband is atheist. He's even not baptized, but we were married. <laughs> In the Russian church, the priest made the marriage. Now, how can you put the crown of the marriage on a head which is not baptized? How? I want to give you an example. What is the baptism, my beloved? The baptism is the foundation of everything. Look at the baptism like the baptism is the table, okay? So now, if you are properly baptized, now you can put everything on the table. Like the marriage the priesthood, uh, the confession of sin, the, um, uh, the oil for the sick, and so on and so forth. But if you don't have the table, how can you put the other things on it? You see? So now I give you another example. You know how many people I take care of them spiritually because they discovered the genuine Orthodox Church just later, and came to me and said, Despota, your eminence, please. We have a lot of problems within our marriage. My wife is Catholic or Protestant, uh, and I am Orthodox. We have two, three children, and uh, we have no common fundament together because she believes differently, I believe differently. We have a problem with our children. You see? This is a genocide, my beloved. 
Therefore, we, the genuine Orthodox Church, always, if people prepare themselves to get married, I always say, first of all, speak together about the fundamental things before you fall in love with each other. Take care about the fundamental thing, which is the faith, and so on. Why? Because we in the genuine Orthodox Church, we never make the marriage an Orthodox with a non-Orthodox. Never. I give you an example. Why then it is also very dangerous? Because this ecumenist priests, they say, there is no problem since they believe in Christ, or even if he's an atheist, but if he signs a document that he allows that your uh, common children uh, will be uh, grown up in the Orthodox faith, so, so let him stay an atheist. I tell you why it is dangerous, my beloved. First of all, I explained to you that you cannot make a marriage with a non-baptized one, right? The second thing is, look at the children. If, for example, the father is a Protestant, the mother is an Orthodox. The Orthodox mother is fasting, preparing herself for Holy Communion, attending long services, all the prayers, and so on and so forth. The Protestant, he takes the guitar, he does not even need to go to the church, stay in the living room and make a hill song five minutes and say, praise the Lord and that's it. No fasting, no communion, no confession of sin, because in the living room or in the bedroom he says, Oh Lord, forgive me, and he's forgiven. So then when your children or when the children grow up, they say, Mom, how come you are fasting almost 200 days per year? You prepare yourself for communion, you commit sin, you go to confession of sin, you have a spiritual father, you have to be obedient. With my father, he just takes the guitar. <laughs> And then your child is saying, <laughs> Mom, I don't want to stay and become an Orthodox. I want to be like my dad because I had a feeling. I have now the feeling I become like my dad. How is it for you? Why you don't speak first about this existential, fundamental things? You go and speak with each other about, oh, how is uh, Spain and how is Florence and you would like to visit New York and, and go to the Empire State Building and then you go together on vacation and you fall in love. No, therefore you have so many divorces, you see. So therefore these pastors, these priests, these bishops who make this inter-confessional uh, marriages are thieves. The blood of that family is to be taken or is to be asked from their hands. Okay, so now, my beloved, there are people, Orthodox, who know about this truth. They say, you know, I don't care what is my priest doing. I don't care about what is my bishop doing or my patriarch. For me, it is important that I keep the faith of the Orthodox Church. Now, look what our Holy Fathers are saying concerning a patriarch or a bishop or a priest who is in heresy. Let us take the great Saint Maximus, the confessor, and Saint Marcus of Ephesus. They say, if your priest, your bishop, your patriarch is in a heresy, you have to cut yourself from him because if you don't cut yourself from him, you are united with him in the heresy. In the same time, these holy fathers say, if your priest is a thief or he is an egoist or he is selfish, he is I don't know what, don't take care or you, you, you don't have to care about it because these are personal sins. But when it comes to the dogmatical church matters, then you have to cut yourself from him. I hear it, hear it all the time. People say to me, the priest says, I am not with my bishop in this ecumenical movement. I keep the faith. But you know the antimension. What is the antimension? It is this towel with the icon of the burial of Christ where we put the chalice and the discourse and celebrate divine liturgy. On this 
uh, antimenson, it is always the seal and the signature of the bishop. So it means when the bi priest is celebrating divine liturgy on the antimension, it means he accepts the faith of his bishop. When he gives you holy communion from that antimension, it means you are united with the faith of your bishop. So now I ask you, can you stay with them if you truly feel you are a real orthodox one? You never, you never ever be able to stay with them. Now look especially what the Antiochians did in 12th of November in 1991. Here we see uh, a document between the Monophysites, the Syrian Monophysites, and the Antiochian Orthodox. And what do they say? They say, your fathers and our fathers, they were mistaken. Now we discovered we are the one and same church. They, are, they entered communion with each other, and even they started to proclaim Wherever there is no Antiochian Orthodox priest, he can go to the Syrian Monophysites, and wherever there is no Syrian Monophysite, he can go to the Antiochian Orthodox, receive from their hand the communion, and so on. You see, my beloved, what this did, our saints who raised from the dead people from the dead, who healed the sick, who cast out demons, who were martyred for the true faith, like John the Merciful, the Patriarch of Alexandria, who was so merciful, but very strict against the Monophysites in Alexandria, in Egypt. All about these saints, these ones say they were mistaken. You and us, we have the same faith. You know, if you are an Antiochian, an Alexandria member, you know that you are in communion with the Monophysites, while the Monophysites are in communion with the Nestorians. Until now, the Nestorians don't say about uh, Mary, the all-praised, all-hymned, all-holy one. They don't say about her she's the mother of God. They say she's the mother of Jesus. Look at the part one. And they refuse to say that our Lord is truly divine and truly human. And they call themselves orthodox. They call themselves protector of the faith. These are thieves. What they did then Alexandria the Patriarchate of Alexandria do. Look here at the document. They followed the Antiochians in the same way by saying the Copt Monophysites and us, we are one church. There is nothing dividing us. And they entered into communion uh, with each other. And through this, the Patriarchate of Alexandria, they just cast themselves out from the church by not being obedient to St. John the Merciful, who gave his precious soul back in the year 619. And you see, if you understood now, my beloved, in the whole Middle East, how the Antiochians fall in heresy, how the Alexandrians fall in heresy, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and so on, now you understand why the whole Middle East, in the spiritual aspect, became destroyed totally. Because the question comes up, which Christianity shall God protect there? A heretical one. Non-Christianity non is better than a heretical Christianity. Because if someone is not a Christian, you know how to deal with him. Because the one who proclaims he is a real Christian, but he is totally in, in falsehood Christian, that makes it even worse. 
Therefore, my beloved, those who fight the church from inside the church are more evil and enemies than those who from outside try to destroy the church. Thank God the church can never be destroyed. But you understand what I'm trying to tell you. The problem is that we have so many from inside who try to destroy the true orthodoxy. So now, these were the Antiochians and the Alexandrians. But we will come right back to them when we speak deep, more deeper uh, about the interreligious dialogue. So now there are some, they say, oh, we are Russians, we are not like the Antiochians and the Alexandrians. Let us come to the Russians. <laughs> let, let us come to the Moscow Patriarchate. What did Patriarch Kirill say? Who proclaimed that he's a defender and a protector of orthodoxy. Remember the picture how he, he baptizes people? Not to speak about his cooperation with the state and not to speak about his more than 4 billion private money, uh, f more than 4 billion dollar he has in his pocket. I don't know um, for what a normal person needs 4 billion, but of course this is his own dilemma. We don't care about it. What did he say? He said, World Council of Churches, this is our common future of the church in the future. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know what this man wants. <laughs> I don't know what he pretend to do and to lead his people to. For sure he does not want to lead anyone to eternal salvation. Now let us see what is World Council of Churches exactly, because we started to speak about, of, uh, about them. In 1937, 1938, more than or around 100 different denominations, Protestant denominations in Oxford, they started to have a common relation together and established World Council of Churches. World Council of Churches today confesses that the same-sex marriages are legal and in the will of God, it has to be tolerated. They proclaim that salvation in all religions exists, so you can be a Buddhist, Hindu, whatever you want. They uh, are standing for the ordination of women to priesthood and so on. And this Kirill, who call himself a defender of orthodoxy, says, this is our common place this is our common future. <laughs> How can you follow such a man? How can you say, I am proud, I belong to the Moscow Patriarchate? How? If this is your future and the future of your children, do you accept this? If you accept it, please stop calling yourself Stop calling yourself orthodox. So now we have to see a statement of Saint Nikolai Velimirovich. Saint Nikolai Velimirovich, he was, he's a great saint. There are many, they say, yeah, but he was a Serbian in the Serbian Patriarchate. But you have to know that Saint Nikolai Velimirovich refused to accept anything what is coming from this uh, uh, patriarchate anymore. And before he was canonized by the Serbian patriarchate, so-called patriarchate, he was canonized by us, the genuine Orthodox. Interesting to see. He, in the beginning, was also involved in the movement of ecumenism. Then he saw what ecumenism truly is. Then he said, this is the most evil thing you shall never be part of it. And he cut himself off from this and he condemned his hierarchy to continue with this ecumenism. So now what happened then in the year 2016? Good that I am sitting because really it makes dizzy. <laughs> I hope you are watching me while you are sitting and not standing. If you are standing just 
take a break and sit because that may this are is going to make you dizzy too. In 2016, Patriarch Bartholomew and all the others made the so-called holy and great council in Crete <laughs> in 2016. And there they made a lot of blasphemic statements. One of them is, they said and confirmed, that ecumenism is holy and it is in the tradition of the Holy Church Fathers. <laughs> I truly ask, which saint fathers did they ever read? And I truly ask myself, from which church fathers do they speak? from all our Holy Church Fathers. Read them and you're gonna see how this Holy Church Fathers are from their holy icons and from their holy relics and from their holy scriptures, writings, they are condemning these patriarchs and those with them, after them and before them who follow the same path as heretics and not, and not as pastors, shepherds, who lead people into salvation. They say it's holy and in the tradition of the faith. Now, maybe there are some Russians or Bulgarians and so on. They are going to say, oh, your eminence, stop, stop. Because our church was not there. Even the Georgian patriarch, uh, Elias, he was not there, so not everyone was attending this meeting. We are not part of it. No, my beloved, you are part of it. I tell you why. Because the attendance of this council was not because of the things were proclaimed there. They did not attend because they had an eternal fight among each other concerning power and politics. <laughs> You must know that before this council took place, more than 50 years, 50 years, all these patriarchates were coming together and preparing all the documents. So it means in 2016 in Crete, they just came together officially to sign them together and to proclaim them because everything was totally in one heart and one mind decided together among all. So their non-attendance to be there, it was not because they did not want to sign this, they did not come because they had political problems among each other, you see? So latest now, from 2016, we the Genuine Orthodox Church have to proclaim even that these made a so-called council against all the holy ecumenical church councils. They are not better even with one iota, better than any other heretical movements. So now my beloved, World Council of Churches, which is the headquarters in Switzerland, has in every country like a uh, organization under it. So World Council of Churches is cooperating worldwide and every country has their own institution. We call it like the daughter institution of World Council of Churches in every country. Here in Germany it is called uh, ACK. ACK, if we look here for example at their uh, web page which they have there, you see that all the uh, uh, different Protestants, the sects, the Roman Catholics, and even the Orthodox are members of World Council of Churches and ACK. And here they have the um, uh, statement that they accept the baptism of each and every one of them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And you know, the New Apostolic, which is a very dangerous sect, uh, I want to show you how they baptized. It's true, it's not fake. They just take a bit water, they put their finger in the water and sign the cross and say you are baptized. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they call themselves new apostolic because they say the first apostles, they were holy after the first apostles. The whole church like didn't exist anymore. And we are the new apostles with Craveta, with here. And uh, uh, I don't know how they appear and with their falsehood and all the dangerous so-called charismatical movements. You know what they do to people. And these Orthodox, they say we acknowledge even their baptisms. And if you take a, a good look at this website of ACK, there is one name you will not find there. The Genuine Orthodox Church. <laughs> because we are never going to be part of such a heretical movement. So now, since we are still with the Russians, let us continue with the um, uh, Russians by a st with the statement of Metropolitan Ilarion Alfayev. Metropolitan Ilarion Alfayev, who is now the Archbishop of Hungaria, because he was uh, deposed from the Patriarch of the uh, second mighty office of the Moscow Patriarchate because of the Ukraine crisis. But for many years he was like the second man of the Patriarchate of Moscow. He said in the official statement of the Russian Orthodox Church, he said, we totally accept the sacrament, it means the mysteries of the Roman Catholic Church, and in fact, there is no real difference between them and us. I truly ask myself why he does not go to Pope Francis and tell him, just simply make me a bishop of yours and shave even his beard and appear like a Roman Catholic. Why? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> then maybe he, he gets even a better salary from the church. If nothing is changed, there is no difference between them. And what did he do as a sign of real brotherhood in fifth, on 15 September 2016? He went to Pope Francis, as you can see here. It was in the official website of the Moscow Patriarchate. And as an honoring and a touching symbol, as a symbol of unity that nothing is dividing them, he gave him a precious relic of Saint Seraphim of Sarov in a precious reliquiary. Can you imagine? <laughs> Saint Seraphim of Sarov, the great prophet, the great pillar of orthodoxy of his time who was the pillar of orthodoxy for the whole Russian world, who was a defender of orthodoxy, a living martyr, who, who was fighting all the heresies, now a part of his relics is in the Vatican Museum. Can you imagine? How horrible! And you know, if people say, Despota, your eminence, please, where are the miracles today in the church? One of the miracles was in 15 September 2016 that the saint kept quiet. Because if the saint would not keep quiet, believe me, the whole Vatican had be to be shaken. And he calls himself a hierarch leading people into salvation. Get rid of him and those who are like him. So now, from interconfessional, we come to the interreligious. Because in the interconfessional, as I said, all these churches are with them. I want to include here something which is very important for you, my beloved. Even the whole Mount Athos is with them. While they keep the old calendar, yes, but you have to know the Mount Athos first, the main parts were with us, with our church, the Genuine Orthodox Church. But because of the tough and hard persecution from the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the Mount Athos said, okay, then let us have like an autonomous status. We uh, accept you as our Archbishop and accept your uh, guidance and consecrations and everything. Just keep us in peace. And, you know that huge parts of the Mount Athos is financed by the Vatican. And they proclaim that they are the follower of saints. I tell you who are the follower 
of saints on Mount Autos. We have monks and skeets. You can always ask our holy church where they, where they are. We have zealots, monks, priests over there who are still in the true tradition of the church while they are poor, keeping being persecuted even on Mount Athos, but keeping the faith, you see? Even them. So now, from the interconfessional, as I said, interreligious, and this was then like the peak of the mountain while the Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Protestants said, we are not going in the interreligious dialogue speak about the one true God, which is the one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They just speak from, about God. How horrible. Denying the truth of the Trinity in order to proclaim we all have the same God. And in fact, they did it. What do they say? They say there are the, the Abrahamitic religions. And in all religions, whatever they believe, we have all the same God. How come? These religions who refuse to believe that our God became human, took our flesh, was without sin, who said about himself, I am the only truth, the only way leads to the Father, that He is the one true God appeared in the flesh. They refuse to believe that. While we have the truth about the revealed God in the flesh, they say we all have the same God. You see? Then, what is the so-called Archbishop Elpidophoro saying in America, if you put one religion over the other or proclaim one religion is uh, more true than the other, then you proclaim that other religions are less others and th with this you deny the other religions or you put them down. How come? What is he celebrating on the holy table, this man? What is he believing? What is he doing? Of course we have the fullness of the revelation. What is our Lord saying? Who does not believe in me does not believe in the Father. Who does not believe in the Father does not believe in God. Who does not believe in Christ has no salvation. You see? So now... In my investigation, I saw in order for you to see how they are. In uh, 1989, in September, Moscow Patriarchate, Metropolitan Petrim of Volokolamsk, translated the Quran into Russian for the Muslims in Russia. He said, in order for them to be more able to follow their path in Islam, did you ever see in the Arabic states that any mullah or mufti or anyone translated from Greek into Arabic the Holy Bible for us Christians to understand our way better? The same, an Orthodox priest of the Bulgarian church, Milan Radulovic, who is a priest now in uh, Canada, he translated the Quran in Ukraine. How come? What are these people doing? Patriarch Parthenius in 1989 of Alexandria said, whoever says anything against Islam or Buddhism, he is saying things against God. I truly ask myself in which God did he believe? And honestly, I don't want to be in his skin right now in front of God. I don't want to be instead of him with such comments. And now, what did the Antiochians do? The Antiochians, they opened their churches for the Friday prayers of the mosque wherever they don't have a mosque. They made the iftar of Ramadan in the churches. They proclaimed that we all have the same God. How come that we have the same God? How come, my beloved, we have the same God? Huh? 
while Christianity is the total opposite of uh, Islam. And these world orthodox, they say, no, everything is fine, we all are together. And now look at them, what they do. They don't only translate the other books of other religions, they even kiss the books of them. You see? You see how they are? And Pat the patriarch of Antioch even let the great Imam of Damascus give a sermon of, in, uh, on Christmas about uh, Jesus to be only a prophet of justice and Muhammad to be a prophet of the mercy of God. And he was applauding to him. What are these people? You see that these people are not Orthodox. Do you see that they are not even Christians? That they are Freemasons trying to lead you into hell. They are only interested in your money and in the power of the state. For example, just to have another picture, an example to this from our Holy Church Fathers. What did St. Nicholas of Mira do? Look at the part one of our documentary. He beat Arius on his mouth because he was speaking out heresies. And these are kissing the books and translating them. You see? And what is, are these people trying to proclaim that we, we, the genuine Orthodox faithful, the genuine Orthodox hierarchs, the genuine Orthodox priests are, they say, they are fanatics, don't go to them. They even call our saints, the pillar of Orthodoxy, they call them fanatics. Shame on them. Shame on them. You see? And then, even, I don't know how they read the letters of uh, the chief among the apostles of St. Paul, because he is condemning every single thing they are doing. You see? And now, we have these so-called theologians. You know, they study theology three years, four years, five years, by putting all, all heretical theology together, mix it up and make something out of it. While the church gives the name of theologian only to three people, like Saint uh, John the Evangelist, the Theologos, or Saint Gregory the Theologos, or Saint uh, Simeon, the New the uh, Theologos. You see, this were theologians. Why? Because they were not only writing about theology, they lived the theology in a manner that they became theologians like divine. You see? And this shave their beards, go on vacation on the beach, and be proud that they studied in Canterbury an Anglican theology or in Rome, a Roman Catholic theology, or here in Germany, a Protestant one. Keep yourself away from this people. So now, what they do, they cooperate with the state, and therefore they are rich. Therefore, for example, the world orthodox here in Germany, they are very rich. They gain money from the ecumenism out of imagination. You cannot imagine how much money they get. And you see always the genuine Orthodox Church, our church, poor, humble. Why? Because we have no support from any state. And you know, we prefer, and let this enter your heart, the genuine Orthodox Church from the very beginning, from the time of the Holy Apostles, from Christ, we prefer to be like in the cave where Christ, our Lord and God, was born, to be a church of the cave, pure, instead of being in the palace of Herodes, killing others. So, now the question comes, who are the real Orthodox? <laughs> it's us. <laughs> We are the real Orthodox, my beloved, who keep the faith, the genuine Orthodox Church, which is also called, called the Old Calendarist, as I explained to you in the beginning. Since 100 years, we suffer persecution. We suffer so many, so many things from these ecumenist people from this so-called ecumenist uh, patriarchates and churches. 
we suffer persecution in a way I cannot really describe it to you. Starting from this ecumenist where we're dancing on our holy tables, shedding the blood of Christ on the ground of the church, walking on it, putting priests of us in prisons, putting bishops of us in prisons. But you know, our Orthodox hierarchy always said, like Saint Chrysostomus of Florina, we will come now to him. He said, I prefer to be persecuted for Christ, for the sake of Christ, instead of being in wealth and honor of this world. So, since 1924, when these patriarchates started to change the calendar, our holy faithful and our holy hierarchy refused to make this change and look how God, with a great sign, approved and give the proof that we, the genuine Orthodox Church, are the true Church of Christ. Because this miracle happened in the history of the Church in this 2000 years only three times. On 14 September, according to the old calendar, the patristic calendar, patristic it means according to the calendar of our Holy Church Fathers. On 14 September in the year 1925, on the feast of the exaltation of the cross, at 11.30 p.m. in the night, while the priest and more than 2,000 genuine Orthodox faithful were gathered for the celebration of the exaltation of the cross. In the St. John Evangelist and Theologos uh, Church in Hymetos, near to Athens, the Holy Cross appeared over the church on the sky for several hours. This was the third appearance of the Holy Cross in the history of the church. The first time the Holy Cross appeared to St. Constantine the Great in the year 313. The second time in Jerusalem under the patriarch uh, St. Cyril uh, of Jerusalem on 7th of May in the year 351. And now... On 14 September, according to the Patristic calendar, in the year 1925. And you know, the Archbishop of Athens sent police and the military in order to put all our faithful in prison who are in that church. And when the Holy Cross appeared, thousands of thousands of people went down on their knees and they were worshipping God and were astonished by the miracle of the Holy Cross, how it appeared. With this, God showed, I am not with the new calendarists. I am not blessing the change of the calendar. I am staying with the genuine Orthodox faithful who keep the tradition of the church. Very important. Among those who were persecuted, we have St. John Maximovich. St. John Maximovich of Shanghai is one of the biggest saints of the 20th century. The great saint who was with the St. Philaret of New York, one of our concelebrators. So if anyone tells you, oh, the genuine Orthodox Church of Greece are schismatics, they are not a real church, they are not really bishops, then let them know that from the Holy Church outside of Russia, the Russians outside of Russia, under the leadership of St. Philaret, the Metropolitan of New York, and St. John Maximovich, our bishops were consecrated and we were in communion with them. You see? So therefore, my beloved, don't let yourself be deceived by such heretics and their false teachings. What happened? In the year 1935, we had three metropolitans from the ecumenical patriarchate. One of them 
the chief among the Metropolitan Chrysostomos of Florina, who is a great saint of our, of our time, then Metropolitan Germanus of Demetrius, and Metropolitan Chrysostom of, of St. Cuthos. These took care about the genuine Orthodox people and priests who were at that time something between 15 and 20 percent of the whole population of Greece. They took care about them in the genuine faith. Then, in 1955, unfortunately, Saint Chrysostomos of Florina, he fall asleep, and in 1955, the genuine Orthodox Church in Greece had no bishops anymore. And then, we had in that time, among the hundreds of hundreds of priests, we had um, like a committee, uh, uh, institution among these priests, 12 of the uh, most educated, honorable one, they came together and with the other priests and the parish, uh, the responsibles of the parishes, they made the request to the Russian church of uh, outside of Russia in America to consecrate bishops for the genuine Orthodox Church in Greece. And you know, my beloved, you must know, in that time, Russia, Moscow Patriarchate, already fall in heresy with this patriarch, Sergius, who cooperated with the, with the state, and all the other patriarchates were involved in ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, communism, and so on. The only church which, which was pure in that time was the Russian church under, uh, outside of Russia, under Metropolitan Filaret and uh, John Maximovich and the other hierarchs. We have plenty saints from them uh, coming in that time, and those genuine Orthodox all over the world, especially in Greece. So in 1960, in 1962, they, the, uh, the Russian Church, consecrated, started to consecrate bishops for the genuine Orthodox Church in Greece. The first archbishop uh, for Greece, or of Greece, was by that time uh, Bishop Akakios of Talantion, and he led the church until 1963. And after him, the very remarkable and the very great confessor of faith, Archbishop Auxentius, until the, uh, from 1963, up to 1994. Archbishop Auxentius of Gardikion, who, who led the church as an archbishop for 31 years, was an archbishop filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was persecuted by some troublemakers, even within of the genuine Orthodox Church, who were in that time already bishops. We can say he's a great confessor of faith and he suffered persecution like Saint Nectarius of Aegina suffered persecution. He led the church in humility and devotion and after him the next archbishop came until the day of today, our present archbishop Macarius, who is the Archbishop of Athens and all Greece from, uh, since uh, 25 of January in the year 2004 until the day of today. So God willing, in the coming year, we are celebrating his enthronement of 20 years in Athens. I have to tell you, my beloved, that our present Archbishop, not because he is our present Archbishop uh, and we serve with him and he serves with us, but he is a great confessor of faith. He established several monasteries. He is very humble and he has a very, very holy spirit, a humble spirit. And his cooperation with, uh, with, with old and young, with everyone, is very humble and very, very friendly. He is a good father and a good shepherd. Um, in general, our holy synod, I allow myself to say this to you. We have among our synods, we are right now 12 hierarchs, uh, everywhere caring 
or taking care about the need of the faithful all over the world, we have great confessors within our synodical members. I, I thank God for this um, blessing that he granted to me with devotion and humbleness to serve with such great members of the Holy Synod. I have to say to this before we continue, when you look at the history uh, of Greece, then you're going to see here and there several bishops who are not members of our synod. Very unfortunately, during the last years, we had a couple uh, troublemakers within the genuine Orthodox Church who had a self-agenda. This, they made themselves schismatics and cast themselves out of the uh, canonical hierarchy of the genuine Orthodox Church. So therefore, if you, my beloved, see, seek uh, your salvation in the true Church, you should, wherever you are, please contact the canonical synod, which is our synod uh, of Greece, uh, taking care about the faithful all over the world. If someone says, okay, how come that in the genuine Orthodox Church you have, or you had some troublemakers who, who cast themselves out and they are now on a self-agenda uh, working by themselves, this you have everywhere, my beloved. Therefore, I just told you this in order when you seek to be genuine Orthodox, please to come to the Mother Church, which is our Holy Synod. So then, we have to understand when our first bishops were consecrated uh, into episcopacy, the Russian church outside of Russia in the uh, US, they were somehow not very clear was it good to consecrate for Greece bishops or not. Finally, they said yes because we are the only one and the genuine Orthodox uh, faithful in Greece are the only one who keep the faith as it was handed down to us by our Lord and the Holy Apostles and the Holy Church Fathers. Now, my beloved, the question comes, what shall the true Orthodox Christian who wants to live true Orthodoxy do in his life? I tell you, my beloved, if you truly confess the true faith and you want to be a true member of true orthodoxy, you have no other choice but to become genuine orthodox. As I explained to you, to be a member under the leadership of a heretical a bishop or priest, it makes you heretical like him. You never bring him to your folder. So therefore, you ma we must acknowledge the writings of the saints, of the holy apostles concerning heresy, concerning uh, the falling apart from the church, like St. John the Theologos, is saying in his writings, in his letters in the New Testament, that they fall apart from us. We have no communion anymore with them. St. Paul, the chief among the apostles, is teaching us this tirelessly, all the time, in every single uh, letter of him, or in most of his letters, don't to be in relation with any heretics. Therefore, I want to give you a couple statements of some of our saints. Let us hear what St. Basil the Great said in the 4th century. He says, Those who pretend to profess the Orthodox faith but maintain Eucharistic communion with the heterodox, it means non-Orthodox, if they not cease to have communion with them after an admonition, may not only not have Eucharistic communion with them, but may not even call them brethren. So it means those who are in relation with them, we cannot even call them anymore brothers. You see? You see what the Antiochians did with the Monophysites, the Alexandrians? You cannot call them even Orthodox anymore. You see what the Russians did, what the Bulgarians did, what the Romanians did? The Romanian Orthodox Patriarchate is considered within the Orthodox Church as the Protestants because with them everything is possible. Everything is possible with them. Look what St. John Chrysostomus said, 
to give back his precious soul in 407, do not accept any heretical dogma under the pretense of love. You see, this ecumenical patriarchates like Bartholomew, he's saying because we love each other, we make this unity. No, it's a false unity because the love is false. If you have a brother, for example, and you love your brother from all your heart, then you will not allow yourself to let your brother uh, in the mistake. You will do everything to get him out of that mistake. Then you love your brother truly, even though if your brother hates you, but you did your best to protect him. St. Theodoros Studites in 826, he says, even though few remain attached to the truth and to the orthodoxy, they constitute the true church and the true body of Christ, you see? So if anyone tells you, but the genuine orthodox uh, faithful or the uh, genuine orthodox church within the church, it's a, f a small number, even if we are only one person, even if we are only five people, we are the true church because we keep the faith. Remember, Maximus confessor, Marcus of Ephesus, they were in their time the only one who confessed the truth. What did Saint Athanasius say when the imperial said to him, Athanasius, you are crazy, the whole world is against you? He said, and I am against the whole world. Thank God. We are several, several uh, or couple hundred thousands all over the world confessing the true faith. So therefore, prefer, and this made me, you know, it makes me happy to be in the true ship, in the true ark of Christ, and to belong to the small flock of Christ, instead belonging to the big flock of Christ, a, a, a big flock which is outside of Christ, and go to, to, to somewhere, and not to eternal salvation. Therefore, our Lord, because he knew it is always only a small flock keeping the faith and the truth, he is saying, don't be afraid of small flock, because my, our, uh, our, your Father in heaven loved it to give you the kingdom of heaven. So it means it is always about the small flock. St. Gregory Palamas, 1359, he says, Those who belong to the Church of Christ are those who are with the truth. Those who are not with the truth do not belong to the Church, you see. Therefore, my beloved, this heretical, they are not Church and this world. Orthodox who proclaim they are a Church, it means they proclaim about themselves that they are not the Church either. Don't follow them. St. Marcus of Ephesus 14.44 is saying, It is good to be peaceful with all, but you must not deviate in matters concerning the true Orthodox faith. You should avoid ecclesiastical communion with those who are separated from the Orthodox Church, nor should you commemorate them for they are false apostles, evil workers, who only to pretend to be apostles of Christ. You see? You see how hard? Saint Nicodemus of Mount Athos 18, uh, 9, he said, But when it comes to the faith and to the tradition of the Orthodox Church, even he who is always peaceful and calm must fight for their pure preservation. He does not mean fight with, uh, with a gun, but he means to protect the faith and to be strong defending the faith and not accepting any falsehood. St. Ignatius uh, Brianchaninov, 1867, he says, Keep away from any heresy and do not even read the books of the heretics. What do they do? They translate the books and kiss them. D do you see this? Then, St. Nikolai Velimirovich, 1956, who wrote the prologue of Ohrid and condemned the spirit of ecumen ecumenism as the devil's work because, among other things, the truth is diluted and negotiated. The spirit of ecumenism is poison. Can you get it c more clear? You see? St. Justin Popovich, 1979, he says, as there is only one Lord and God, so there is only one Holy Church, all outside Orthodoxy 
are heretics. You see? And what did this ecumenical uh, orthodox proclaim? They proclaim they are not apostates but churches. You see? So now, what did uh, St. Philaret of New York, who fall asleep in 1985, proclaim with the whole synod in 1983? Listen carefully, my beloved, he says, those who attack the Church of Christ by teaching that Christ's Church is divided into so-called branches, which differ in doctrine and way of life, or that the church does not exist visibly, but will be formed in the future when all branches or sects or denominations and even religions will be united into one body, and who do not distinguish the priesthood and the mystery of the church from those of the heretics, but say that the baptism and the Eucharist of the heretics is effectual and salvation for salvation, therefore to those who knowingly have communion with this aforementioned heretics, or who advocate, dissem uh, disseminate, or defend their new heresy of ecumenism under the pretext of brotherly love or supposed unification of separation, separated Christians, anathema, they shall be cast out of the church. You see, this is my beloved, the statement of the saints. Therefore, I must tell you, yeah, we live today in the time which is the worst one of all, because now we have all uh, heresies during the old centuries combined into one big heresy, and everyone is following them, everyone is going with them. The only one who do not follow and continue with them and go with them is the genuine Orthodox Church. The genuine Orthodox Church is the real continuation of the church established by Christ until the day of today. And beloved, the time would not be sufficient for me if I would start explaining you concerning Gregorius, the, the saints, Gregorius Theologus, Firmilianus Caesareus, Athanasius Alexandria, Cyril of Alexandria, Cyril of Jerusalem, John the Merciful, uh, of Alexandria, Sophronius of Jerusalem, Maximus the Confessor and all the other saints and even the saints of our time of today. And look, my beloved, that our ch church produces saints until the day of today. Look at this example. Uh, Saint John, uh, I'm sorry, Saint Chrysostomus of Florina, 1955, or Saint John Maximovich, 1966, Saint Hieronymus of Aegina, 1966. You know, concerning Saint Hieronymus of Aegina and Saint Mirtidiotis of Clisura, 1974, take good care about what you are hear hearing from this ecumenist because they changed their biography they made out of them a new they made out of these two new calendarist saints they changed the biography and they ignore the truth that they were consecrated by us like saint hieronymus of aegina a priest and a monk by us and saint mirtidiotisa by the old calendarist church that she became a nun, they even changed her name, but by taking away from her the ordination to the uh, monastic life and uh, confess her as Saint Sophia of Clisura. You know, these people are not afraid even to, to, to change the life of the saints. How can they be afraid? Since they changed already the, cha uh, the faith of, of Christ and the apostles and all the saints. And Saint Philaret of New York, 1985, and countless other saints during our time which we did not canonize officially until the day of today, but in the future it will be canonizations of saints in the modern time, which we already know today they are saints, but I don't want to list them here now. So you see, my beloved, I truly hope and pray to God that this docu documentary of these three parts will lead your conscience, your mind and your heart to the truth.
And I truly must say this. I worked very hard on this documentary in order to provide to you the truth, the pure honey, the sweetness of our faith. I really believe if this documentary does not, is not, if this documentary is not sufficient for you to understand what is the truth, I truly believe is an, if an angel from heaven comes down to you and explains to you the truth, you will never come to the truth. Therefore, please go now to the prayer. Look inside of you. Make an investigation about everything what I explained to you in, this three docum- uh, in these three parts. And you see that I provided to you the whole truth of the church. Therefore, if you truly want to be a son or a daughter of the Holy Orthodox Church in the continuation of the Holy Church Fathers, as it was given to us by Christ and the Holy Apostles, then don't wait any other second anymore or any more minute. Convert to orthodoxy, to the genuine orthodoxy. Try to contact our hierarchs or the priests near to you. Come uh, to them, to us. Have conversations. If you have questions, you may write even to uh, my secretary, here is the email uh, of uh, my monastery. You may write an email or try to get in contact with us. Here you have also the, um, the website uh, of our official website and get in contact with us. We, w- we are trying to give you all the answers with a clear conscience, a pure conscience in honesty truth and reality. My beloved, I pray to God that uh, all this work which was done now will help you and your beloveds to find the truth. I uh, made this uh, documentary because of my pure love to Christ our Lord and His Church and because of my love to our Holy Synod and the members of our uh, Holy Church, that everything uh, uh, will be for the glory of God and for the salvation of the souls. May God bless you. May God be always with you. And may God always protect you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be always with all of you. Amen.